Well, good morning. I'm going to tie that into this sermon, believe it or not. So today we're looking at Daniel chapter 4, and 99.98% of the um, sermons, if you look at Daniel chapter 4, are going to be about Nebuchadnezzar. But what I want to talk about is Daniel. You know, what was going on with Daniel at the time that chapter 4 takes place, and what happens, and why is Daniel's faithfulness, why does it make a difference? Because here's the truth for you and for me. Every day uh, that you go to work, every day that you even volunteer or go out of your way to sacrifice for somebody else, there are times that you will want to quit. How many of you have ever wanted to quit helping or doing something good? Anybody? Yeah, everybody. Okay. Um, by the way, Dave, I just want you to know I listen to other musicians too. I do. I was listening to Stephen Curtis Chapman on the way here, and uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. No, listen, let me, I do want to encourage you in something. Did you act like you were going to leave? I do want to encourage you guys in something. It is healthy to listen to different pastors, and it is unhealthy to not listen to different pastors. And here's why. Because you can get a different perspective from God's Word from different teachers. If you're only under one teacher all the time, and that's the only person you listen to, we call that a cult. And so let's not, let's not do that. And, and most people who get around me go, who let you become the pastor? So I like that even better. Oh, let me give a disclaimer about that movie real quick too. If you watch it on like TNT and edited, it is a very different movie than unedited. So I would encourage you to watch the edited version as a pastor, just so you know. So I asked you, do you ever want to quit? Or, or maybe you don't want to quit, but maybe after experiencing some things at work or even when you're helping at an organization, whether it's a volunteer organization or something, maybe you decided, you know, I'm just not going to work as hard as I used to. One of the things that we don't realize is that the big question is who do you work for? And the big answer to that is, you work, if you're a Christian, you work for God, regardless of where you are. Regardless of whether it's at your house, whether it's washing dishes, whether it's doing clothing, whether it's uh, mowing the yard, whatever you do, the Bible says, do is unto the Lord. So when you're serving at church, you're serving as to the Lord. But the real truth is, for many of us, one of the reasons we want to quit is because we forget who we're serving. And I want to tell you how that happened and how that's happened to me before I get into Daniel chapter 4. And Daniel chapter 4 is interesting because it's Nebuchadnezzar. He has a dream. He brings Daniel in. It's a dream about a tree. And basically, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is prideful and arrogant, which we know because every brick in Babylon that we've discovered just about has his name on it, which is, you know, I mean, you got to be pretty prideful if every brick you put down has your name stamped on it. Uh, but he gets prideful, and what happens? He goes crazy. God allows him to go crazy until he recognizes him. And at the end of the book of, uh, of chapter 4, we have the last view that we have of Nebuchadnezzar, and he turns to God. And um, if his repentance was real, I hope that we will see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, which would be pretty cool because it looked like he had a cool beard. All right, so um, I want to tell you about Rotary. Some of you know I'm in Rotary, and I'm not promoting Rotary today. I have, I'm telling this story on it for a, a reason. Um, I joined Rotary probably about eight years ago. And um, I the reason I joined Rotary was uh, uh, one of the guys in our church went, and he said it'd be really good for you. And I had been praying about something because I talked to a few friends of mine who were pastors and they said one of the biggest things that happens to pastors over time is without meaning to, we become monks. Because we only hang around Christians, we only talk to Christians, we only run in Christian circles. All the things we know have to do with ourselves. We never get out. And I said, you know what, I need to join an organization to get outside of myself. So I joined Rotary. So I'm in Rotary about eight months, and this is the part of the story I want to tell you. So I'm in Rotary about eight months, and, and a lady, very sweet lady, calls me. She says... Eric, we need some people to run for these offices they had. They had different officers and stuff, and we just don't have enough people. Would you be willing to run? Well, I thought, 
well, I don't, it's not like I need something extra to do, but sure, I'll, I'll be willing to run. And they also called a guy from our church named Paul Chineris. If you know Paul, they asked him to run. Well, the day comes, the next meeting, and I thought they were just going to get up because they told me they didn't have enough people. Just get up and announce everybody who became officers. But they didn't. They said, we're going to have an election today. And then they looked at me and said, Eric, do you have anything you want to say? So I stood up and said, I'm willing to serve. And I sat down. I didn't know that it was an election. So they'd go through the election. Can I tell you the two people that were not voted in? Myself and Paul Chineris. So I'll tell you what I did. Publicly, I said, no big deal. What's the big deal? I didn't really want to do anything anyway. And then I got in my car. And I did exactly what you do. I said, I'm not going back. Why do I want to be in a group that doesn't want me to serve? They, I mean, they asked me to run for something. And then I found out they didn't need me to run. Why would they ask me? And I got mad. And I said, I just won't go back. And then I thought about it. No, no. I know that God wants me to do this. So I'm going to go back. But you know what? I'm not going to help. I'm not going to serve any extra. I'm just going to do the minimum, you know, the things I have to do. I mean, I'm going to go to church, but I'm just going to sit there. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Was that a little personal? You know, because I helped one time and they didn't acknowledge me, you know, and and I started getting frustrated and mad. Right. And that goes really well. Let me just give you a secret. If you don't want God to mess with you, do not read the Bible. Because the next day I'm reading the Bible, I don't even remember what verse it was. But it was like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, So, are you part of Rotary for you or for me? I said, me. No, I didn't. I said. And so I decided that even though my feelings were hurt, I would go back. And by the way, for a silly reason, right? Wouldn't you consider that a silly reason? That I would go back and I would just, anything they asked me to do, I would just do it. And so that's what I started doing. They needed somebody to do the website, I did the website. They needed somebody to help with Facebook, I helped with Facebook. They needed somebody to do an Instagram, I did an Instagram. They needed help lining up backpacks. I lined up backpacks and our church even donated a bunch of backpacks. Now let me tell you what came out of that, the big deal. By the way, I was president two years ago. <laughs> Guess who's president this year? Paul Chineris. So it's going downhill fast. Y'all need to pray for Rotary. <laughs> I told Paul I was sharing this story today. But let me just give you a few things that came out of this, just so you'll know. We found out about a group called Family Promise, which hosts homeless families. And we have several times over in our other building hosted homeless families. And many of you have helped. Some of you have helped me as we've given and donated to the Brevard Sharing Center. And the guy who's the director of the Brevard Sharing Center goes to... Coco Rotary, and also the Boys and Girls Club of Coco. Some of you have gone over there and pulled weeds with us and cleaned up the building and found out about them. And guess how I found out about the Boys and Girls Club? I also got to meet the new mayor of Coco and the new police chief of Coco. Well, the mayor has been there, but the new police chief in Coco. Now there are police officers park in our parking lot and chase the sheriff off. It's great. I love that. By the way, they're both welcome to park in our parking lot. Now, here's the other neat thing. In just the last few years, about seven different people from that Rotary group have started coming to our church. And just this last year, I was able to baptize one of the Rotary members' grandchildren just this year. Now, I could have quit. I could have cut back. I could have said it's about me. Because we all feel exactly how I felt. When you serve, people don't do what they should do. But guess what? You're not serving them. You're serving God. And that's what Daniel knew. So when you are faithful, there's some things that are going to happen. Number one, you need to know that those who are far away from God will listen. Why? Because when you serve God, other people notice. So Daniel chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse 6. By the way, if you look at the divisions, you'll notice the first three or four verses probably should be in the last chapter um, we did the numbers later. That's another story for another day. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. By the way, time out. 
wise men of Babylon, there was this group in the New Testament that visited Jesus with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which just happened to come from Babylon. Just giving you an idea of who these wise men were. Just, you know, just what a coincidence that is, okay? So I commanded the wise men of Babylon to be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and dividers came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. So what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He called all of these people. Then it says, finally, Daniel came into my presence. I told him the dream. He's called Belteshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy God is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. Now, I want you to notice something you probably never noticed. Nebuchadnezzar called everyone else first. Have you ever said, how dare they not call me first? How dare they forget what I've done in the past? How dare they not appreciate me? I mean, think of Daniel, okay? Let me give you some of our excuses and what Daniel could have said, okay? Uh, They don't appreciate me. They, They tried to kill him. So that would be a lack of appreciation, wouldn't you think? I've been through a lot, so I can't serve anymore. Daniel could have said that. You know, did you know Jerusalem was under siege for over a year? We couldn't go three months without toilet paper here, people. <laughs> Imagine a year with nothing, everything cut off. They chose others first. That's what happened in this chapter. I did my part already. Remember, Daniel had saved all of them and nobody noticed. Don't you think one of the guys coming before the king would have said, hey, you you really need to call Daniel. He's the dude. But no, they all come in to see him first. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar's forgotten what he's done. But guess what? Daniel doesn't let that bother him. He still does what God called him to do. People, when you help them, they will not remember. Listen, they will not remember what you do for them. You will serve people, and some of the people you serve will attack you, but you're not serving them. Some will hurt you. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 2.12. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. By the way, if you look at last week's sermon, you're going to see this verse. Do you know why? Because it's important. Daniel was an example to everyone around him to the point that when he finally came before the king, the king's like, all right, all right. I know you can do this. Even though I haven't called you because Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to hear from God anymore, right? So he called everybody else first. You ever feel that way at work? You ever feel that way at home? You ever feel that way when you're helping somebody? Well, I'm not helping anymore. I'm not doing anything anymore. Now, I'm not talking about enabling people. I'm not talking about not having good boundaries, But I'm talking about those times that you quit simply because you weren't acknowledged, you weren't accepted, you weren't praised. Number two, when you are an example, you can speak the truth in love. Listen, you have no testimony if your walk doesn't match your talk. Did you hear me? If you say, oh, I'm a Christian, but your walk all the time is angry and frustrated and irritated and you don't tip your waiter or waitress, and you cheat and steal and lie, you have no witness to people outside. Verse 18, we pick up. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. So Nebuchadnezzar goes on to tell Daniel this dream about a tree that grows up, is cut down, is bound. And then when you read it, all of a sudden it says, he will be sent into the woods and basically is going to go crazy. And I think Nebuchadnezzar was like, wait a second, that went from tree to me, right? For none of the wise men in the kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. (laughs) Now, if you were Daniel, what would you have said at this point? So why did you call me last? He didn't. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Alarm you. Answer, my lord. And they, uh, Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. You know what Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel? Daniel, don't be afraid. You've earned the right to share with me. 
Have you earned the right to share with the people you work with? Have you earned the right to share with the people, the neighbors who know you? Have you earned the right to talk about God, to show others God's love by the people who you work with, who you're around when they see what you do? Nebuchadnezzar, who basically at that time was king of the world, looked at Daniel and said, you don't have to be afraid. You tell me what's on your mind. And so Daniel did. It wasn't good news, by the way. Then he says, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And then Daniel says this. He adds this in. So he interprets the dream, tells him the part at the end that he's going to be driven away. And then he says, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. See, Daniel had been around Nebuchadnezzar, had been around his kingdom enough that he knew where Nebuchadnezzar needed a little help. Nebuchadnezzar was cruel. Nebuchadnezzar was not fair. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed his enemies anytime he wanted to. There are many stories famous for what Nebuchadnezzar did, and yet Daniel was able to look him in the face and say, you know what? If you'll humble yourself, God may just forgive you even now. And so Nebuchadnezzar ignored him for a time. In Acts 3.19, the early disciples said this, repent then, turn to God, so your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Do you want to be an example to others? I'll never forget. I got to hear one of Bill Bright's last sermons. If you don't know who Bill Bright is, he started Campus Crusade. And I was fairly young at the time. And I want you to know why I listened to Bill Bright. I remember when he came on the stage, he had oxygen. Somebody pushed pushed him out in a wheelchair and he stood up. He had oxygen on him. He could barely breathe. But that's not the reason I listened to him. The reason I listened to him is not too many years before I had talked to somebody who worked for Bill Bright who told me, do you know about Bill Bright? I said, no. He said he was speaking at a big conference. And and when he got to the hotel room, it was him and an assistant. And when he got to the hotel room, they walked in the room and there was one bed. And Bill Bright, who spoke all over the world, who could have demanded any income he wanted, said to the guy, you sleep on the bed, I'll sleep on the floor. And Bill Bright, the head of this huge organization that helped thousands and thousands and thousands and maybe millions of people, slept on the floor. When I heard that story, when Bill Bright got up to speak, I said, I want to hear what that guy has to say. In your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your church, Be such an example to people, not perfection. Nobody is perfect. You're going to mess up. But be such an example of somebody who goes through hard times the right way that people who are far from God say, that's somebody I want to listen to. That's somebody I want to pay attention to. Do you know somebody who is far from God? Pray that God would give you opportunity and the ability to speak into their lives. But first, make sure your walk lines up with your talk. Number three, so not only those from far away from God will listen, not only can you speak the truth in love, number three, others will find salvation. Listen, when you are serving God and not you, it stands out. Every once in a while, somebody will say, well, Eric, how do I know if something I'm hearing is from God? You know, I'm just not sure it's God. Most likely, if it's unselfish, it's not you. Because most things you tell yourself are about you. That's why the news tries to make you angry and scared. Because those are our favorite reactions. Fear and anger, right? I mean, some of you woke up this morning either afraid or angry because something you watched or something you read or you were on Facebook all morning or whatever, and you're either angry or upset. Why? Because they're trying to push you that way. Why? Because it's about you. You're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to protect yourself. It's about you. But when you love the Lord, what happens? God puts you outside of you. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar basically hears Daniel and he's like, oh, that's a good sermon. Thanks for that. Now I'm going home. And he forgets all about the sermon. Does that sound familiar to anybody in here? Nobody in here, right? Right, Dave? 
So Nebuchadnezzar on his way home forgets it. Nebuchadnezzar basically stands up one day and says, I'm king of the world, which he was. The guy who put his name on every brick in the city that they still find with his name on it. And this is what happens next. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people, ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with dew of heaven. His hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. By the way, there's about three or four years that there's no recorded activity in Babylon. And boy, archaeologists don't know why. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, listen to this, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. What happened? He remembered Daniel's sermon and he turned to God. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion's an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Basically what Nebuchadnezzar says, it's as great as I am, my kingdom will end. By the way, on the walls of Babylon, the inscription says that. Nebuchadnezzar knew his kingdom would end. And then a few verses later, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. Why? Because everything he does is right. All his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar was able to say, I'm nothing compared to him. Do you want your life to honor God? Recognize that God is awesome. And he absolutely loves you. And when you're in obedience to his will and doing what he wants you to do, you never know when he'll use you. This week I took my mom to the doctor. And I said, uh, Mom, you want me to come up with you this time? The doctor started allowing people to come up. She said, yeah, yeah, I need, I need a memory. So I got to be Ram. A little extra Ram for my mom. So I go up. So we're sitting there, we're talking to the doctor. The doctor harasses me all the time because I'm a pastor. You would love it. I can't think of all the things he said this week, but they were terrible. Harasses me, his nurse there taking notes. And he finishes and walks out of the room, and the nurse turns and looks at me and goes, just so you know, I watched one of your services on TV recently. And of course, I'm waiting for that. It was great, it was bad, it was terrible, and she walked out. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying about that. Whether you know it or not, your neighbors noticed you going to church today. Whether you know it or not, your neighbors are paying attention to your life. And when they go through a hard time or a difficulty or a challenge, you will be the one that they will say, would you pray for me? You will be the one that they say to you, what's different about you? If your walk matches your talk, and if you realize, I'm not here to serve me, I'm here to serve God. Daniel never, under all the different kings, and we're going to get to some other ones starting next week, Daniel never forgot who he really served. Listen to what it says in Acts 5.32. We, and it's talking about us too, are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. What does that mean? That means you need to pay attention in your heart to the Holy Spirit that's in you. God has made you a witness of who he is, and now you're to be a witness to others through the Holy Spirit in your life. And most of us think, well, that means something big. It means I got to preach to my neighbor. No, no, no. What it means is you need to be obedient to God at work. I'll never forget a lady came to me from work, from a workplace, and she said, you know, I'm the only one in my office that washes the dishes. And I said, are you supposed to be washing the dishes? She goes, I don't know, but it makes me mad. And I said, well, one of two things has to change. You either need to stop washing the dishes and let them pile up until everybody notices there's dishes all over the office. Or number two, if you really feel like God wants you to wash the dishes, you need to change your attitude and quit washing dishes for everybody else. Well, which one should I do? I don't know. Pray about it. See, being obedient to God does not mean you're a doormat to everybody else, but what it does mean is that you're obedient to Him. So that means sometimes you go ahead and do the laundry you don't, feel, you don't want to do, and other times you leave it in your teenager's room till they can't get out their own door. <laughs> Which do I do, Eric? You pray about it. God, help me to be your witness. The Holy Spirit will show you. It's the same thing when you go to invite somebody to church. You ask God, God, give me the opportune time. 
Give me the right words to say. God, show me when I should do this. And he will. Just like in the life of Daniel, in enemy territory, God can use you anywhere you are. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your struggle, whatever your past, whatever your hurts, God wants to use you and others are watching you. I know you want to quit sometimes. Some of you had to quit. Some of you are coasting. Hey, instead of serving those people, don't listen, don't serve your pastor. Serve God. God, I want to serve you. Don't volunteer anymore. Serve. God, I want to serve you. And just do what he called you to do. You'll do it with joy when you do that. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're here today, and as I talked, you thought of maybe a neighbor or a friend or somebody at work that needs Jesus. I want to encourage you, write their name somewhere and start praying for them. You'd be amazed at how God will open doors for you to invite them to church, to tell them about Jesus, to talk about John 3.16, to even lead them to Christ if you'll begin praying for them. So pray for them. Don't be afraid to do that. And most of all, just ask God help you to be obedient every day in all that you do. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Thank you for each one here, each one watching online. I thank you, Father, for the opportunities we have to witness for you. Not because we're great, not because we have our act together, but Father, we're simply being obedient to you day after day. Lord, help us to know when we're supposed to do things like wash the dishes or not. Show us when we're supposed to serve and reach out and love people, but help us to always do it with the right attitude, not because we're noticed, but because we're serving you. May we serve you with great hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.